Thank you. What a warm reception. Thank you, Mark. It's such an honor and a privilege to be part of PNG and their Start Strong, Stay Strong campaign. And to be here with all of you today, speaking in front of a military audience is one of my favorite audience to speak to. And I know, I think I was told a statistic where 85% of you have served or have family who have served. So before I begin, from one veteran to another, I just want to thank all of you for your service. And thank you for all of you've done for this great country of ours. Yes, definitely. So you just heard a little bit about my story. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more. I'm going to fill in the details for you. And as I tell you my story, the goal is that you take away any sort of inspiration and knowledge that you take from it and you apply it to your own lives, your career, your personal lives, whatever it may be. And the goal is that when all of us walk out of here today and fly back home, is that you think about your own lives. You reflect on how we all have the choice to make our lives what we want it to be. And we go home even greater than the great people we already are. So my story, at least the most dramatic part of it, was 14 years ago now. I was newly arrived in country, in Iraq, and I was dedicated and eager to do my job. But like most things in life, everything happened so quickly. The combination of a convoy, of a roadside bomb, and a lot of blood, which happened to be my own blood, resulted in the loss of my left leg above the knee, as you see here. And while there are tragic moments to my story, my story is not a tragic one. My story is one of tragedy turned into triumph. And my story is a true example that we all have the power to overcome obstacles that come our way. And a lot of times ending up even better on the other side. So my real story actually started in a gymnastics gym. I'm sure many of you were athletes when you were younger and I was no different. And I would go into this gym before school, after school, and I would dream of making the Olympics. And before every gymnastics meet, I would stand on that floor mat, hand on my heart, and I would imagine myself getting a perfect 10 in that American flag, because I was every young gymnast dream. And while that 10 never happened, what did happen was developing a deep love for the flag, for the red, the white, and the blue, realizing at a young age how lucky we were to live in the country that we do. And as I grew a little bit older, and I saw military personnel either on TV or walking around the community, their uniform on, flag patch on their shoulder, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So when anybody asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? I always said I wanted to be in the Army. So my story eventually led me out to the University of Colorado in Boulder. And freshman year, I saw cadets marching around campus. I could tell that they were a team, and I wanted to be part of that. So sophomore year, I was basically a recruiter's dream because I marched my way into his office and I said, I want to join the Army. Where do I sign? He handed me over a piece of paper. I signed. In turn, he gave me my first uniform. I went back to my dorm room, put that uniform on, and just knew that that's what I was supposed to do. The pride I felt with that flag patch on my shoulder. Now, I don't come from a military family. My parents knew of my desire to be in the Army, but they kind of thought it was a phase I was passing through, because why would their youngest daughter like, really actually want to be in the Army? So imagine their surprise when sophomore year, they get a phone call, and I'm like, guess what, Mom and Dad? I just joined ROTC. I'm going to be in the Army. And there was kind of this awkward pause, as parents can do. And suddenly, my dad blurted out, they allow girls in the Army? So it was this unknown world that we were all diving into together. But of course, they allowed girls. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the leadership skills that I learned, the camaraderie with my fellow cadets, singing cadence, um, being physically fit. I got to paint my face with camo. I got to roll around in the mud. I loved it. I loved everything that ROTC and being a part of something bigger than myself. And then senior year of college, and a day that none of us will ever forget because it truly changed the world, September 11th of 2001. And if you recall, this day was a Tuesday. And like every Tuesday, it was ROTC day, so I was in my uniform. And I was sitting in a class with my fellow cadets watching the news unfold on TV. And it was this day that our instructors looked at us and said, today your lives are going to change. 
It's not a matter of if you'll deploy to a foreign country. It's more a matter of when. So I knew that the uniform that I was so proud to wear on American soil, that I'd probably be wearing it on foreign soil as well. But first, I graduated, and I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army with my once skeptical, but now very proud parents by my side. And I set off into the wide world of the Army. The fateful day of April 13th, 2004, started out just like any other day. We were in country, we were in Iraq, and I woke up early. We had our briefing as we always did. The difference between this day and other days is that instead of leading a convoy, I was actually just riding along. I was gonna learn the route because the next day I was gonna take over for that route and lead the convoys. So instead of sitting next to the driver, I was sitting behind the driver. And if there was ever a cool place to go in Iraq, where I'm sure many of you have been, it was called the Green Zone. So in the Green Zone, you had Saddam Hussein's palaces, you had the Cross Sabres monuments, and it was kind of an iconic place to go. And it just so happened that I was gonna start leading this convoy to the Green Zone. But on my ride along, I was gonna learn the route. I had my camera on my flak vest, ready to take it out and take some pictures if the moment arose. But like most things in life, didn't really go as planned. Our vehicle left the gate. About 10 minutes into the ride, we, got, we came upon this underpass, this bridge. And our drivers were taught to swerve as they went under in case someone was above it and drop, dropping something into the vehicle. So our driver started to swerve, and suddenly there was this boom, this deafening noise, the loudest sound I'd ever heard. Looked up and the windshield was cracked. Our vehicle swerved to the left. We ended up ricocheting off of a guardrail, serving back to the right, and eventually crashing into this Iraqi woman's house. Now, we'd all been through situations like this in training because that's what training was for. And everybody else in my vehicle, all four other soldiers, executed what they were taught perfectly. They got out of the vehicle, they surrounded it, they pointed their weapons out to really assess the situation and to see what the next course of action was gonna be. So I started to do just that. I reached down, took my seatbelt off, looked over, looked down. I knew something was wrong. There was a lot of blood. So I called out, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, something happened to my leg. And lucky for me, there was a combat medic who was two vehicles back. He heard me calling out, and he rushed to the vehicle, and he pulled me out by my bulletproof vest, and he laid me there on the sands of Iraq. Now, at the time, I thought he was administering first aid. I know now, many years later, that my leg was gone, it had been severed, and that he was actually saving my life. But as I lay there on my back, nobody told me my leg was gone. I couldn't see. I couldn't look up and see it. The pain hadn't set, it yet, set in yet. And in my mind, I was wondering why there was so much commotion. And in my mind, I thought I could move my foot. I know now it's called phantom pain or phantom sensation, where you think you have something, but you no longer do. And it wasn't until the medic put a tourniquet on where, number one, the pain started. Number two, the realization that it probably wasn't as good as I thought, because we all knew that whatever was below a tourniquet is probably no longer. And then a few days later, seeing this picture and realizing that that was my vehicle, and yes, my blood as well, and a picture that was once hard to look at, but this many years later, I'm able to look at this picture and really see how far I've come. But it was hard to believe that just one year earlier, I was at my very first duty assignment, Fort Hood, Texas, part of the 1st Cavalry Division. I was a brand new 23-year-old second lieutenant, and I was thrown into these leadership roles of being put in charge of a platoon with soldiers older than I was, being put in charge of millions of dollars worth of equipment. And getting to Fort Hood and really trying to find, my, find it to be a home, kind of like a, my, my, new, my new home. And what helped was having places like the exchange where I could go, where as soon as I walked through those doors, they helped me feel like I was at home. And being able to go there with my fellow, with my fellow platoon leaders, with my husband, 
and to be able to find the things that we needed to make our home the home that we wanted it to be. And then in early March of 2004, orders came down that the 1st Cavalry Division was going to deploy over to Iraq. So I knew my time was going to come, and here it was. So, boarded a plane with thousands of my best friends, uniform in hand, weapon, or uniform on, Kevlar on, weapon in hand, boarding a plane in hopes that we could go over and make a difference in the world. Doesn't really set in where you're going until you step off in Kuwait and the heat hits you and you feel the weight of your equipment and you drive through these barren landscapes. You look across in the distance and you see a hut and you realize that those are people's homes and just how different the day-to-day -day life is over there. And then making the journey from Kuwait up into Iraq and crossing the border, and your heart starts to beat a little bit faster. Getting to the bustling city of Baghdad where there are people and vehicles everywhere. And just wondering, do they want you there? Do they not want you there? And just wondering what your day-to-day -day life will be like. And eventually we got to the town of Taji, which is where we were gonna be for the next year and settling in, trying to find our new normal. Now I had two jobs over in Iraq. The first was my favorite, because I got to be a platoon leader to 20 of the finest men and women that I've ever known. Many of them 18 years old, just out of high school, trying to find their way in the world. They, thought they find themselves with me as their leader in this faraway land, but you become family, that camaraderie stronger than ever. My other job was a convoy commander, so basically in charge of leading a whole bunch of vehicles from one point to the next, delivering various supplies, in charge of communications with headquarters, the route, the soldiers, just trying to make sure everything went as it should. We'd been in Iraq for three short weeks, but I was a proud soldier. I was leading soldiers. I was carrying out missions. I just never thought that a roadside bomb would come into my life, because you always think things like that are going to happen to somebody else. But this time, it was me. And I was lifted, kind of like out of a movie, from the sands of Iraq, and I was put in the back of this big five-ton pickup truck, where I was driven to the nearest aid station, where I was put on a helicopter and flown to the nearest American hospital, which coincidentally enough happened to be in the green zone. So I got there, just not quite like I had planned on it. The helicopter landed and I was taken off and put on a stretcher. I still had a T on my forehead that said for tourniquet. So in case anybody found me, they knew that I was severely injured. And I was rushed into a life-saving surgery. I was told I didn't have much time. A lot of blood was being lost. And it wasn't until I woke up from this surgery and I looked to the gentleman next to me and I said, I think something happened to my leg. I still had no idea. And that's when he looked at me and he said, it's gone. You don't have it anymore. And they handed me a phone and said, would you like to call your parents? Being a mother now, I can't imagine the horror of a phone call. That your youngest daughter has been severely wounded in a war. But looking back all these years, I look at this day and this moment, and I realize that this is the day where my real life's journey began. Because starting from day one, I had a choice. Two roads I could take, the downhill road that was easy the constant wonder of why me, the self-pity, or there was a road that went up, a little bit harder to take, but accepting the loss and choosing to move on. And from day one, I feel like I started out on that high road, and I did move on. First, I moved on from Iraq. I was put in the, this transport cargo plane where we were stacked three high, and I was brought to Lonschild, Germany to stabilize before making the long trip back to the US. And it just so happened when I got to launch, Joel, that my dad happened to be on business in Vienna. My sister lived in Slovakia. So the day after this life-changing injury, I got to have two immediate family members rush into my hospital room to be by my side. Talk about starting things off right, literally right on the right foot. That's funny, haha. -ha. Spending a few days at Launch Jewel before making the long trip back to the United States, this time to Walter Reed Army Medical Center, which at the time is where all the wounded soldiers went from Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was here where my mom met me. And my dad followed not far behind. And again, my once skeptical parents 
now by my side, trying to help reassure me when I needed it and me reassuring them when they needed it and being a team, strong and steadfast together. But when I was able to kind of come to and look around Walter Reed, I'm sure some of you have been there and you might realize how powerful a place Walter Reed is. So you go to Walter Reed and you can see a lot of devastation because there is, of course, devastation. But you can look past the devastation and you can see resilience because there is so much resilience there. And when I was able to look around, I saw other soldiers who were missing two, three, four limbs. They had lost their eyesight. They had traumatic brain injuries. And I looked at myself and I thought, holy cow, am I lucky? One leg, that was it. I had three good limbs. I had my mind, I had my eyesight. Not to mention, I had my life. Because too many had given the ultimate sacrifice and continued to give. So making a promise then to live my life for those that no longer could, who had given that ultimate sacrifice, and not to let losing a leg stop me from doing anything that I wanted to do, in my life. And yes, I did receive Purple Heart and a Bronze Star, obviously medals I never expected to get, but are proudly displayed in my home. But what made my time at Walter Reed great were the doctors, the nurses, the family and friends that dropped everything that they were doing to come to be by my bedside. But as you can imagine, it can be trying as well. I had gone 24 years of my life with both of my legs, suddenly I was missing one. So laying there in my hospital bed, wondering, would I walk, would I run, would I be independent? But if there was ever a place to be, to do your rehab and recovery, the place was Walter Reed. And the doctors and staff, they did what they could to help us pass the time. And so did visitors. We had visitors from high-ranking political officers, celebrities, um, military personnel. And it was always exciting morning when we would wake up and the nurse would come in and they kind of tell us if there was any, if there was any big names coming that day. And I like to share my two favorites because they obviously stood out. So one morning the nurse runs in all excited and she's like, guess who's coming today? And I'm like, oh, who? And a few hours later, Tom Hanks walks in the room and extremely genuine, sits down on the bed. We have a great conversation. That night there was an event and he gave me a shout out and I thought I was like the coolest person ever. And then a few weeks later, The Osbournes walk in. So Sharon sits on the bed. Ozzy kind of wanders around. There's a stack of like six chairs he tries to sit on. And I don't know how to small talk with Sharon Osbourne, but they're a little bit blurry, kind of like the picture. But I am forever grateful to everyone that took the time to come to the hospital, come into our rooms, and let us know that what we did made a difference. I also learned at Walter Reed that as silly as it may seem, that it was okay to celebrate the loss of a leg. And a lot of soldiers or wounded veterans have what's called their alive day. So every year, on the day that they lost their leg, instead of mourning what they've lost, they celebrate what they had. They celebrate life. This was a pretty genius idea, and I took it a little bit further, and I actually named what was left of my leg, Little Leg, and decided that every year we were going to have a birthday for Little Leg. So we did an epic photo shoot, that is my leg with a hat on that says life is good, and decided that every year we were gonna celebrate not just Little Leg's life, not just my life, but everybody's life. Because it's so easy to get caught up in the little things in life, the little day-to-day things. If you take a moment to take a step back and to think about it, we are all so lucky to live the lives that we do. So taking a day to celebrate that. But back at Walter Reed, what was pretty exciting was the day I got to go back down to physical therapy, regaining the strength I had lost from being in my hospital bed for so long. Then the day came where I was fit for my first prosthetic leg in this series of castings and measurements. And then a few days later, they give you this leg and they're like, this is going to be your leg and you're going to walk with this. And you're like, what? This piece of plastic and metal. And I don't know, I don't remember learning how to walk when I was younger. If any of you do, that's very impressive. But being put in the parallel bars with this piece of metal and plastic, and they're like, okay, and now walk. And I remember looking across the physical therapy room and seeing a gentleman missing both of his legs and an arm, and he was walking. Talk about perspective. Walking first in the parallel bars, going to crutches, then a cane, and then realizing that I could be independent. 
my life would go on. The only difference is that every day I'd wake up, put my prosthetic leg on, go about my day as all of you do, take it off at night and go to bed. Talk about an exciting day. But as soon as I learned to walk, I always wanted more. And to me, having grown up a gymnast and being involved in sports for my whole life, more to me was being back into athletics, living the life of sports again. And I had this inner drive to want to be on a race course, to want to hit the, cross that finish line, to hit the wall in a pool, whatever it was. So as exciting as this day was, even more exciting is what I like to call the start of Melissa Stockwell 2.0. So at Walter Reed, they had all these organizations whose mission was to come into our hospital room and get us out of our rooms doing things that we never thought we'd do with, with two legs, much less with one. So before I knew it, I was at the New York City Marathon doing power on a bike that I powered with my arms about five months after losing my leg and doing 26.2 miles, a distance I never thought I'd do anything in. But crossing that finish line and realizing that I could still be an athlete. A few weeks later, I went out to Colorado and learned how to ski on one leg, having grown up a skier on two legs. This time I'm on one leg, kind of wobbly. We had little poles that have skis on the end of them, on the bunny hill at first. But by the end of the week, all the way up the chairlift, flying down that mountain, trying not to be, rec maybe a little bit reckless, but the wind in my hair, and I had never felt so free in my entire life. And going back to Walter Reed saying, if I can do this, well, then I can do anything. And it came at a pretty great time because somebody came to Walter Reed to put a presentation on about the US Paralympics. And I sat in a room, kind of like this one, and I listened as this gentleman talked about the Paralympic Games and how it was basically an Olympics for somebody with a physical disability, which I now had. If I trained hard enough, if I dedicated myself to a sport, I could wear the USA uniform and I could compete on the world's biggest athletic stage. In 2004, I knew there was gonna be a 2008 Paralympic Games and somehow, some way, I was gonna be there. But first, I was medically retired from the Army and I set off into a new career because April 13th of 04 it changed my life in many ways. So going back to school in the field of prosthetics a field I didn't even know existed until I needed a leg of my own. But learning how to fit other amputees with artificial limbs and just the reward of seeing them get back, literally get back up on their feet and their faces light up when they realize that they can still live the lives that they wanna live. But always in the forefront of my mind was this wanting to be a Paralympian. Now, the Paralympics is not like the military. You don't, you don't sign up and go. You have to beat your competitors. You have to beat certain times. So I decided that I was gonna give it a shot in the sport of swimming. So I didn't have to wear a prosthetic leg when I swim. I could use my crutches, get some laps in. And if any of you are swimmers, you understand that the water has a healing effect. The water just made me feel whole. It's almost as if I forgot I was missing my leg. And I randomly loved the smell of chlorine, so it was kind of a good fit. So I swam and swam and swam. And after I graduated school for prosthetics, my times were here. They needed to be way down here if I wanted to make that 2018. So I put everything on hold and I moved out to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. I slept, I ate, and I swam, and I swam, and I swam. And almost four years to the day after losing my leg, there was a Paralympic trials. And I was a total long shot to make the team because at this meet, I had to make certain times. I had to beat my competitors. Again, times were here. They had to be here. But I went into this meet and learned a pretty cool lesson. And that hard work pays off. Took 20 seconds off a 400 meter freestyle. I broke American record I didn't even know existed. I was so far from them. And at the end of the meet, when they named the 2008 Paralympic team, and my name was on it. This whole journey, I, was go I went from Baghdad. I was gonna go to Beijing. To me, everything came full circle and it all made sense. So naturally the next step was Beijing. Now, if any of you watched the 2008 Olympic Games, you might recall seeing Michael Phelps win eight gold medals 
and the renowned water cube, this state-of-the-art structure that they built just for the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. So I got to watch Michael Phelps win his gold medals, and two weeks later, found myself with my coach standing there in that water cube, imagining myself on that podium, or taking another 20 seconds off, because that's realistic. But being on the podium, and just what greater honor would, be, would it be to have that medal around my neck? So I swam in some freestyle events, some butterfly events, and every day when I walked out to the blocks, I looked up into the stands and saw a flag that said, Little Leg Fan Club. And I knew that my family and friends who had come all that way were there for me, regardless of what happened. And I wish I could tell you that I was on that podium, that I did get a medal, but I didn't. I didn't have best times, I didn't make finals. And at the time, this was my life, this was everything. And I felt like I had let everybody down. My teammates, my family, my friends, my coach, my country. Because I just knew I had should have done better for them. But at the end of the Paralympic Games, there's a closing ceremonies and somebody is nominated to carry the American flag in, typically reserved for someone who's done well athletically, who has those medals to show. But when my teammates nominated me for this honor, I realized that in life, it's not always about the medals. We all wanna be on top, we want the recognition for our hard work. But it's about the journey to get there. It's about overcoming obstacles that come your way that you never expect, about having the heart to persevere through them. And this moment, being able to carry an object that I'm so passionate about, to march into a sold out stadium and represent the entire US delegation. In life, we all have moments that you wish you could relive over and over again. And for me, this was one of them, just the magnitude of the moment. So Beijing came, Beijing went. And how do you beat that? How do you beat the Paralympic Games and carrying the flag? Well, I did what most people would do is I went back home to Chicago, where I currently live, and I went back to work. The field of prosthetics, and again, being able to help somebody stand up out of their wheelchair, to help somebody put on a running leg and run down the hallway for the first time. So rewarding to literally show people what they can still do. But I knew I wasn't done being an athlete, because once an athlete, always an athlete. And in 2009, I was invited to do a triathlon by a group called the Challenge Athletes Foundation. Now, triathlon is swim, bike, and run, and something I used to think only crazy people did, because who wants to like swim, bike, and run all at the same time, all on the same day? But I was invited to do this race, and I thought, you know what, I'll give it a shot. So I went out to California, I swam, I biked, I ran. I crossed that finish line, and I was hooked the challenge of all three sports, being on the same course as able-bodied athletes, the challenge of wearing different prosthetics for the bike and the run. If any of you are triathletes, you, there's, this, there's this transition area, and after your swim, you come back to it. After your bike, you come back to it. And typically, you have your bike there, you have your running shoes, your biking shoes, and I would have my bike, my biking leg, my running leg, and I'm coming in, and there's like legs flying everywhere. I'm trying to get my legs on and off. I fell in love with it with everything that triathlon brought to my life. And turns out I wasn't so bad at it. Over the next many years, I was able to compete around the world on the national team and internationally at world championships. And my very first world championship happened to be in Budapest, Hungary. And my first time ever putting on a uniform that said USA, a triathlon uniform with my name on it. And the horn went off this day and I swam biked and ran as quick as I could. I got near that finish line and I knew that I was in first place and I was handed an American flag and I got to cross my first world champion finish line, USA uniform on, flag overhead, and to stand on top of that podium and to hear that national anthem. Talk about emotions. And then the next year, my second world championship in Beijing, China, where I got to redeem my performance from the Paralympic Games and to be on top of the podium again. Then the third time in New Zealand and let me tell you that running across that finish line with that flag overhead will never get old. And then in 2013, wanting to kind of step it up a notch and test myself, not just physically, but mentally as well, and sign up for the elusive Ironman, which if there ever is an event for anyone who's a little bit crazy, it's this. Because you have 17 hours to complete 140.6 miles, 2.4 mile swim, 
112 mile bike and then a 26.2 mile marathon that you run at the end. This race is not about winning, at least for me it's not, but about finishing. You start when it's dark and you finish when it's dark. So this day I swam, I biked, I ran. I got to mile 20 of that run and I wondered what on earth I was doing there. Because not only was I out there, but I paid to be there. <laughs> and having to dig deep. Sure, physically, but I had done the training. But the mental part of it and wondering how on earth I was gonna get through those next six miles. Digging deep and realizing that I was out there on that run course because I could be. I was running because I could be. I was running for those who couldn't. So finding that mental energy to put one foot in front of the next, make it closer to that finish line, getting to that finish shoot and hearing the roar of the crowd, helping me float through and hearing the words that I was an Iron Man and realizing at this moment, a lot of times in life, we don't give ourselves enough credit on the things that we're able to do. If you only try, you'll be amazed at the things your mind and your body can accomplish. So it's been 14 years since I lost my leg. When I look back, I can honestly say I've done more in my life with one leg than I ever would have done with two. And true to word, every April 13th, we celebrate Little Leg's birthday. And it's become this big event where family and friends fly in. There's celebration, there's dancing, there's party favors, there's cake. This year we added in a party bus. We may or may not drink out of my leg, but that's for those that come to find out. But it's truly a day to celebrate, not just little leg, not just my life, but everybody's life. And to take a moment to reflect. And when I reflect back on the past 14 years, I've had some pretty amazing experiences. Been able to ride a mountain bike and share a dance with George W. Bush at his ranch in Texas. I even got a presidential kiss when I presented him with an American flag that flew over the Olympic Village in Beijing. Be able to share my story with Katie Couric and her viewers. Who doesn't dream about a fist bump with Tom Brokaw? I've been able to stand in a room with, at the time, were all five living presidents and their spouses on the most historic day that I have ever been a part of. A day that wasn't about politics as so much is these days, but it was bringing both sides together. It was honoring a man, a president, George Bush, and the opening of his library there in Dallas, here in Dallas, where I had the honor of being asked to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Saying the Pledge of Allegiance and going home that night just dripping in red, white, and blue. Just so proud to live in the country that we do. Be able to share a laugh with Michelle Obama ride my bike around D.C. with Barack. And most recently, some of you may have seen a book called Portraits of Courage. It's a book that George Bush, he painted over 60 wounded veterans and the honor of not just being in the book, but of having this moment that meant so much to me, this dance that we shared, and him choosing to paint this moment. So now I have it forever memorialized in the book and in my office at home. And if any of you have not checked out the book, I urge you to because proceeds go towards helping wounded veterans like myself reintegrate back into civilian life. But out of all this, what I'm most proud of is giving back because I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for people and organizations that helped me out along the way. So back in Chicago, co-founding a group called Dare to Try. It's a paratriathlon club and we get youth, adults, and injured service members into the sport of triathlon. So we take away any barrier that somebody with a physical disability has, whether it's the expensive adaptive equipment, is it the training, is it needing transportation to get to the race, whatever it is, we help take it away and we help our athletes get to the starting line. And you take somebody like an eight-year-old Amanda who's missing her leg like I am, and she gets bullied in school because kids can be tough. She, we find out about each other. We help her get to that starting line. She swims, she bikes, she runs. She crosses that finish line and you can just see the self-confidence grow. Not just in her, but her family as well. The self-worth that she gains. She gets a medal that says she's a triathlete. 
She goes to school the next day and suddenly she is a school hero because she is a triathlete. The motto at Dare to Try is one inspires many. And it's truly one of my proudest accomplishments as our athletes inspire both on and off the race course. And then being a part of P&G and their Start Strong, Stay Strong campaign in a place, having a central place where military families can go to connect, to find resources, to find things local to their own bases. So just really giving back to kind of that next, the next step, that next military generation that just continues to grow and the need continues to be there. And I'm proud just to help them see what is out there. And then of course, on the personal side, my family. So I know the theme of the conference is family first. And being a mother now, I know more than ever how important family is. And back at home, my husband, Brian, my three and a half year old son, Dallas, my daughter, Millie, nine months old, and this whole new motivation of being a parent, wanting to dream even bigger in hopes that my kids see me dream big and they turn around and they have big dreams of their own someday. And being able to grow up, grow with my kids as a mom that has one leg. And the cool part about having my son being able to walk around the house and point out my walking leg and my running leg and my biking leg and being able to watch, wanting to help me put my prosthetic leg on. Just a part of showing my kids that anything is possible. And a pretty cool picture that my son will have for show and tell is having President Bush hold him at five days old and something that he'll be able to show off later in life as he grows. So it's been a pretty amazing 14 years. If I could go back and do it again, I would. Because of the people I've met, the experiences I've had, and just the realization of how precious life is. And I've learned a lot along the way. I've learned that life is short, as I'm sure many of you know more than others. I've learned that a 23-year-old woman who loses her leg can not only still wear high heels, this is very important, but the toenail polish can go on a plastic prosthetic foot. It can also come off, very important detail. And as cheesy as it may sound, I have learned that dreams come true. And in September of 2016, mine did. Because after having my son Dallas, I was able to come back, get back into shape to be at the elite level and to qualify for the 2016 Rio Paralympic Games in the sport of triathlon. And of any day that my race could have taken place, the date was September 11th. And I woke up in Rio this morning, I put on my USA uniform, and I knew that this race was about so much more than myself. That every swim stroke, every bike pedal, every run step wasn't for me. It was for those that no longer could. Being able to swim, bike, and run my way up and down the streets of Copacabana Beach. Coming across the finish line in third place, getting a bronze medal that felt like my personal gold standing on a podium on a historic day because it was a USA sweep where gold and silver were my USA teammates. Standing there on that podium watching not one but three American flags go up as we heard our national anthem. Standing there on that podium thinking about how so many years ago somebody tried to take my life. They didn't. They may have taken my leg but they didn't take my spirit. My friend Haley next to me who lost her leg to cancer, she didn't let that stop her. Standing on that podium and showing the world how much ability was in a disability. And this time being able to hug my dad and my husband with tears of joy, just so proud to be in that moment. And the best part about it was going home to my son, putting the medal around his neck in the culmination of the hashtag Mommy Road to Rio. And my son was not able to make the trip to Rio, so we did have jumbo sized heads made of him for my parents to bob around the race course for that extra motivation. He'll bring those heads to show and tell someday as well. 
So in conclusion, I want to share with you a few things that I've learned in hopes that you can bring them with them, apply them to your own life, and leave here being greater than the great people you already are. First, things never go as planned. You guys know that by now. When you're younger, you have these ideas of what you want your life to be like. You want to be on this job. You want to be a superstar basketball player. You want to be married by this age, this many kids. That doesn't happen. There are twists. There are turns. There are obstacles that come your way. But we all have the strength to fight through those obstacles, to fight through those difficulties. And a lot of times when we do, we end up even better on the other side. But to do this, you have to believe in yourself. And you should believe in yourself even when you doubt yourself. We all have temporary setbacks that come up. It's a given. They're going to happen. But don't let those temporary setbacks swallow up any positive attributes that you have. Because I promise you, they are still there. Look around. You guys are a team. Your family is your team. Your coworkers are your team. When I look back at the teams that got me here today, starting from my platoon, the doctors, the nurses, my family, Team USA, I am in awe. Find people that you trust in. Find people to rely on. Because when it comes down to it, we are all in this life together. Lastly, if you start each day out with a positive outlook, it might end up being your best day yet. The glass can definitely be half empty, but it's always half full. And any difficulties that come your way, I can promise you, there is something good about them. There is a silver lining. You may have to dig deep to find them. You might not find them right away. But figure out some way to make your difficulties desirable. So I've just shared with you my story, and, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the things that I've done. I'm proud to stand up and show my leg off as a proud above the knee amputee, as a proud American. And if any of you were to come up here and to share your story, I hope that you'd be proud of it as well. And if you're not, the time to make a change is not next month, it's not next year, it's now. The beauty in life is that we all have the ability to choose our own story. We can choose our own path. You can choose how you deal with any obstacles that come your way.